Hi, I'm Brian Johnson, and I've spent a fair bit of my life on stage and on the road. And I thought it would be fun to talk to some of my friends who've done the same and survived. So I'm meeting young Roger Daltrey from The Who, Pebblehead Nick Mason from Pink Floyd, chatting to Robert Plant about Led Zeppelin and beyond, to Sting about the early days of the police, as well as Joe Elliott from Def Leppard and Metallic as Lars Ulrich. So, let's hit the road. Welcome to Brian Johnson's Life on the Road. I'm in New York City, and I'm here to meet an old pal who comes from the same part of the world as I do. In fact, he was born seven miles down the road from me. He used rock and roll to get out of the back streets of Wall's End in the northeast of England to the skyscrapers of Manhattan. He was christened Gordon Matthew Sumner, but the whole world knows him as Sting. <laughs> Sting shot to success in the late 1970s with The Police, a power trio which emerged from the punk scene to become, by the early 80s, the biggest band in the world. Just to pass away, I love you, but at the height of their fame, Sting walked away to launch a solo career. Over the next three decades, he explored jazz, world music, and he even played the lute. I sit, I sigh, I weep, I faint, I die. And in the process, became a unique, multi-Grammy winning global superstar. But Sting has recently been reflecting on his early life on the road and the route to the big time. And on his new album, he has returned to the idea of being in a simple rock and roll band. I can't stop thinking about you. I can't stop wanting you this way. I can't face living without you. That's why I'm searching out I want Sting to show me the place where he kicked off his very first American tour, way back in 1978. So I'm picking him up at his apartment on the Upper West Side. Yeah, hey, Brian, good to see you. Hey, get your banjo there. God, it's freezing out there, man. Welcome to the van. <laughs> nice it fun. is very cold, yeah. No, it is good to see you. I'm going to give you a hug. <laughs> Sting has homes all over the world, but these days he likes to spend most of his time in New York. A city he dreamt of when he was struggling to make a living from music. I had no money. No? Not at all. Just a dream. Somehow a confidence that it would come OK. That was the romance of it, Brian, you know? Yeah. The, the, making a living, or just, just making a living as a musician, seemed the most romantic thing I could think of. Yeah. Of. And uh, that's what I do now. So uh -huh. I dreamt my present life. I uh -huh. dreamt it. Jeez, you dreamt it well. <laughs> In the pull of New York, my son, it, it's still magic. It's still got the romance it had for me when I was dreaming about New yeah. York. You walk everywhere in Manhattan. Yeah. I mean, it'll take you a while, but you can walk everywhere. Yeah. And people recognize you, but they're not intimidated by no. fame or celebrity because all New Yorkers have a self-esteem yeah. and you're just on their TV show. Yeah. So they say, hey, Stan, how you doing? You know, like your music or you yeah. suck. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's direct and it's real. One of Sting's latest songs is about how musicians from the Northeast have used life on the road as a way to escape to a better future. Many have gone before us now. Many tried and failed somehow. Many a soul on the Queen's Highway, or many a tail light load with the promise of a better life heading south on the Great North Road. I heard that song that you did, Going South on the Great oh, North Road, which is a great song, by the way. Thank and, you. And it was evocative for me of the animals. You yeah. remember that We've song? We've got to get out of this place. We've got to get that out of this place. That was our anthem. That was all of our anthems.
Growing up in the northeast of England, like me, Sting's earliest exposure to music was from records, and usually American records. My mother, who was a quite a good piano player, loved music. In fact, my first memories of, of Audrey, my mum, playing the piano. But she'd bring uh, 78s into the house. She'd buy Little Richard, Bama yeah. Lama, Bama Lou. She'd bring in Teddy Bear by Elvis Presley. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis doing Great Balls of Fire. And it, it just it sent me into like a paroxysm of excitement. Yeah. I used to get kind of catatonic listening to this yeah. music. I don't know why it was so exciting. Or the Tequila by the Champs. Oh, yeah, all right, yeah. That used to drive me. I used to play it again, and, and the yeah. record play became my best friend for a long time. Yeah. I wore it out. So. And with me, it was just, you know, the BBC television used to have those interludes, remember? And it'd be like somebody, a potter. And at one time, out of the blue, it just said, and uh, now, an interlude. And here's a young chap from America called Little uh, Richard. And it just cut to this immaculate looking black guy going, and I just, it was like somebody had thrown a hand grenade into the room. We never heard anything like no, it. And, he was uh, serious. And the horrible thing was, we didn't have a record player, and I wanted to hear it again so bad. You didn't have a record player? No, we didn't have a record You were player. poorer than we were. Uh, no, my dad just thought it was a waste of time. <laughs> my dad's attitude was, well, you've heard it once, what do you want to hear it again for? And that was the way he was, you know? You know what I used to do with a, a record player? I used to get 45s, <laughs> and I used to play them at... 33, mm -hmm. so I could figure out the guitar parts. Uh, all right, but okay. if I wanted to hear the bass part really well, I'd yeah. turn the 45 up to 78. It's so yeah. the bass would come to the yeah. front and I'd figure out. So th it, the record player was my teacher in many ways. But it was a Newcastle musician, Bruce Welsh, of The Shadows, who gave Sting a picture of what success might be like. One of the seminal guitar bands in England were The Shadows, yes. two, two of whom. Yep. We're from Newcastle. From Newcastle. Hank. Hank Marvin and Bruce Welsh. And I remember seeing Bruce Welsh coming down Westcott Road in a Rolls Royce. I was waiting outside the cinema there, sold out to see something. And he was driving down his Rolls Royce, hey. thinking, I want some of that. They danced well. That thing they did. That was one step. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was one musician who blew both our minds back in Newcastle when we were young, and it was Jimi Hendrix. You were at the Club of Gogo yes. in 1966 when Jimi Hendrix I was there. I couldn't get in because I didn't have any money. And what I did, I got out on my hands and knees and well, that was you, under it? the thing <laughs> that with me, sneaking out. And I got to the back, but when it was, I wasn't a very tall kid, and I couldn't really see much except the flash. Yeah. The machine heads. Yeah. And this... But the, 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 the ceiling of the stage was like this far above. <laughs> Absolutely. His, that was their first gig in England. Ever? I think so. In England. Well, there was a Newcastle connection because Charles Chandler, who was the bass player on The Animals, was yes. the manager. Oh. Well, that would explain why. And then they stayed at Charles's mum's house in Gateshead, apparently. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and the phone was ringing, and, and, and uh, it was really professional, Brian. It's my 14-year-old Nokia. Sorry about that, lads. It's very embarrassing. I do beg your pardon. I bet you've got yours turned off, have you? I don't have one. Not even a Nokia? No. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. There's an exclusive right here in this van. Sting doesn't have it, so don't try to phone him. He's busy. <laughs>